the building this morning. Great to see you guys at home. Shall we pray? Let's just pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being able to meet, Lord, in the building and in our homes again. Lord, we say again, Lord, we say each week, but Holy Spirit, whatever you've got for us this morning, we say yes. At the outset of the meeting this building, Lord, we just lift our hands to you and just say, Lord, we love you. Lord, you're everything to us. You're the one who gets us through life, Lord. You're the one who breathes life into us. And this morning, Lord, we just ask you to come afresh in our lives. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that when we leave this building today, Lord, when we finish in our homes today, the service, we know we've met with you, the living God. So Holy Spirit, just come, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Thanks, Ian. Our Father everlasting, the old created one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceived in Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in Christ Himself. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is free and one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Yes, I believe in the name of I judge and I defend her, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is free and one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. Yes, I believe in the name. I believe in the name. 
I believe in God our Father, and I believe in Christ the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is free and one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Yes, I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, I believe.
We thank you, Jesus, that we have a Saviour who carries our cares. And this morning we can declare in the building, declare in our homes, that we are not forgotten. Wow. Lord, every one of us, Lord, have been, well, have been pressurised this, this last 14 months. The pressure, Lord, and the trials and the, Lord, the fear we've all had. But Lord, not once have you ever forgotten us. Because we have a saviour who carries our cares. We have a saviour who loves us. We have a saviour who gave his life for us. And this morning, as church, as church family, we just celebrate that you gave your life for us so we could be adopted into your family. That we could become sons and daughters of a living God. And as our celebration this morning, we take the emblems, we take the bread, we take the cup. And we give you thanks. And we think of the words of Paul to the Corinthian church. When he said, for I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Shall we take the emblems together? Shall we take the bread? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's take the cup together to the King. We thank you, Lord, that we are not forgotten. Wow. Well, it's Sunday, the 9th of May. Just to remind everybody, next Sunday, the, the Sunday service is in your homes. And then we'll be back in the building on the 23rd. So you can start booking your tickets from today for Sunday the 23rd, which is not next Sunday, but the, um, the Sunday after, which would be brilliant. Just want to look at 1 Peter this morning. In 1 Peter, Peter says these words, May God give you more and more grace and peace. Who wants that this morning, hey? Wow. May God give you more and more grace and peace. And then, then he goes on to say this in 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 9. And these past 14 months, we've faced many trials, haven't we? But this is what Peter says. Every trial we face is worth immeasurably more than gold. Wow. In other words, when we overcome... Or get to the other side of the trials in Christ, it is worth more than what gold could ever buy. Our reward of trusting in Him is the salvation of our souls. Wow, it's brilliant, isn't it? This morning, we have a number of people who are going through trials at the moment, and so it would be good if you're just going to put their names to God this morning and just ask for God's touch upon them. So if we just close our eyes, just lift, lift our hands in the building and in our homes. And we're just going to pray for these people. And we ask God for his amazing touch upon their lives where they are today. Heavenly Father, we just lift these people to you this morning and pray for your amazing touch upon their lives. This morning, Lord, we pray for Dave. We pray for Sylvia. We pray for Nigel. We pray for Norman. We pray for Amy. We pray for Darren. We pray for Louise. We pray for Owen. We pray for Cherif. And we pray for Kerry. And you know each one, what each one needs, Lord. You know every need, what they need this moment in time. And so, Father, please touch them where they are today. Because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Again, I just want to thank 
Everybody who's been giving online, it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. And if you're in the building today and you'd like to give a gift, there's two white buckets by the exit doors. Please put your gift in there before you leave. That would be brilliant. Elium have just produced a brand new CD. It's come out this week. Here it is. God is still moving. It's, a, it's great, isn't it, Ian? Absolutely brilliant. And, and you can purchase a copy today for £10. So after the meeting, outside, if you like one, I'll be outside. Just say, Steve, I would like to buy one. Can I buy one for £10? That's absolutely brilliant. Can I just, just remind everybody at home this, um, this morning, the kids, that at 2.30, it's Kids Call with Kate on Zoom. So don't, so don't forget that. It's a great time with the kids. Have a great time for that. That's brilliant. And so we're just going to look at the notices for this coming week. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Sonil. to Yvonne now who's going to bring the word to us this morning. Thanks Yvonne. Thank you. All right, well, good morning everyone. Good to see you in the building and great to those of you who've joined us online today. Really good to be with you. Okay then, so how many of you here have ever lost something, maybe something that's precious or valuable, Maybe some jewellery or maybe a pet. Anyone ever lost anything here? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Well, I remember a few years ago now when the Elam Conference was held in Butlins in Minehead in that holiday camp. And it was held there the week after the Spring Harvest Conference. So Elam used the same great big tent for their celebrations that week. And I remember being at the evening celebration in the big tent and it finished around 9.30 and then everyone sort of piled out of the tent. And it was dark, but there was a little tiny bit of light through a little lamp. Um, and as I was coming out, I must have kind of like knocked my eye and my contact lens fell out. So there I was shouting, stop, 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 Steve, 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 stop. <laughs> My contact lenses fell out and it fell onto the ground, which was kind of like, you know, just as you come out the tent, it's just like this mix of a grass and mud and gravel. And so it was dark and we'd stopped in our tracks and loads of people were coming out and a few people were stood around and saying, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I was saying, oh, I've lost my contact lens, I've lost my contact lens. And then Steve got on his hands and knees in the dark trying to find my lost contact lens. And I've got to be honest here, Steve is much more like Jesus than me because he has real determination when he's looking for something. You know, if something's lost, you know, he'll do whatever he can to try and find it. And you know, if anything's gone under a chair or it's gone down the back of anything, whatever it is and wherever it's gone, Steve is the one who's determined to find it, and he usually does. Anyway, believe it or not, as Steve was looking on the ground, on his hands and knees, looking around for this contact lens, because they're only really tiny, I was thinking, there's no way that he's going to find it. Absolutely no way will he find it. But sure enough, he did. <laughs> he did find my contact lens. It was amazing, really. And isn't it a great feeling? when you find something that you've lost. But isn't it a horrible feeling when you lose something, isn't it? Anyway, another occasion, right? I was at my mum's house, and again, the same thing happened. My contact lens fell out, and Steve looked everywhere for it, and we couldn't find it. 
So Steve actually got the vacuum cleaner. And bear in mind that my mum had a dog at the time. Steve vacuumed the whole room and then he got the empty vacuum bag to see if he could find my contact lens. <laughs> is that amazing, isn't it? But on that occasion, he didn't find it. But you know what? He still showed great determination and persistence in looking for it. And then how about another question? Have you, have you yourself ever actually been lost? Anyone here actually been lost? Yeah, yeah. So a few years ago, it was a number of years ago now, we went to Scotland for the very first time on a holiday and we had Andy with us, so he was about 12 or 13 years old. And we got to our caravan around about 7 p.m. in the evening. And we decided to have a little ride out to the nearest town, which was about half an hour away. Anyway, we got there, and it was lovely, it was great. We had a little look around. And then on our way back, we realised we didn't have any details or any address where the campsite was. And that was in the days before you had your smartphone where all you kept all your details on your phone. So we were in the southwest of Scotland. We've never, ever been there before. And all the roads looked the same. They were just like green, you know, dual carriageways with the green grass middle and green grass verges. And at the end of every dual carriageway, there was a green grass roundabout. And we were just driving up and down the dual carriageways for ages and ages, trying to find the caravan park where we were staying. And we genuinely didn't know where it was. We couldn't even remember what it was called, so we couldn't have even asked anyone if there was anyone around. So, as you do, if you're a good Christian, you pray, don't you? <laughs> and eventually, after trying many different combinations of the dual carriageways and the roundabouts, going to the right, going to the left, going down this one, coming back again, we did eventually find our caravan park. But for a time, we were quite worried about it because we really, really had no idea where it was. And it was getting late and it was dark. So you might be wondering now why I'm telling you all this. Well, just recently, I was reading about Zacchaeus in Luke 19. And there's a verse, verse 10, and it's where Jesus says this. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And those words just kind of, they kind of like just landed on me and they just stayed with me for a while. Do you ever have that experience where some, you know, a sentence out of the Bible just sort of lands on you? And it's only like 13 words, but it just summed up everything about Jesus, really. That he came and he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so I just want to look at those words in a little bit more detail. So that, those words, the Son of Man, it means that Jesus left his father and the glories of heaven and he came to us on planet earth in human form in the form of a man totally without sin and he came to fulfill his father's plan he came to seek and that word seek it means to search for something to search until you find it to go in search of desperately determined urgently and earnestly and then the word save that means to deliver to protect to heal to rescue to make whole and the word lost means unable to find your way ruined or destroyed physically or morally so we know we know that Jesus intentionally came to us he came for you and for me he came from heaven as a human being and he came to look for us, to search for us and to find us. He came to save us and to rescue us and to deliver us from ultimate destruction, and to deliver us from ruin and to deliver us ultimately from death. Those are amazingly powerful words. And so I want to go on now to Luke 15, which I think probably a lot of you might be familiar with. But in the first seven verses of Luke 15, we read about a lost sheep. And this was a parable that Jesus told to the religious people of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes, because they were always complaining about how Jesus was associating with dishonest tax collectors and notorious sinners. They really didn't like it. 
especially because oftentimes, not only did he sit with them, but he ate with them, and he was comfortable with them, and they were very comfortable with him. And because of that, the religious people really didn't like it. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, will he joyfully carry it home on his shoulders? When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. And then Jesus says to the Pharisees, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner, over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who haven't strayed away. So Jesus tries to explain to the religious people how important and how valuable that people are to God, even the ones that wander off and stray. And in this instance, he uses the illustration of one sheep who got lost and how the shepherd left the other 99 to go and look for him. And you know what? He didn't stop looking for him until he found him. And it doesn't say how long it took, and it doesn't say how difficult it might have been trying to find a sheep that had got lost. But it does say that when he found him, it says with exuberant joy, he put the sheep on his shoulders and carried it back with cheerful delight and called all his friends and neighbours together to party and to celebrate. And then to reinforce this message, Jesus told the religious people another parable. There was once a woman who had 10 valuable silver coins when she lost one of them. It says she swept her entire house, diligently searching every nook and cranny for the one lost coin. When she finally found it, she gathered all her friends and neighbours for a celebration. Yes, all her friends and neighbours. And she was telling them, come and celebrate with me. I had lost my precious silver coin, but now I found it. And Jesus said, that's the way God responds every time one lost sinner repents and turns to him. He says to all his angels, let's have a joyous celebration for the one who was lost I have found and in these two parables we see the extraordinary value that Jesus puts on every person's life and this is what he was trying to explain to the religious people who just couldn't see it and who just you know they were just the kind of people who just continually judged and criticized and complained about him all because he hung around with the sinners the bad guys and then if we go on then to the parable of the lost son it says in verse 11 it says this to illustrate the story even more <laughs> jesus told them this story now jesus really really wanted them to know that god's desire is to bring people all people regardless of your background and your circumstances his desire is to bring everyone back to himself and in the story of the father and the two sons we see that the father was a great father he was a great dad he looked after his sons really really well he loved them they had everything they needed it would seem like he wasn't short of money they seemed to have plenty of food and clothes they had servants they had plenty of land so they all had a pretty good lifestyle but the youngest son became dissatisfied and he wanted the money. He wanted his share of the inheritance so he could go off to a distant land and go and enjoy life for a change. So he got his share of the inheritance and so he had plenty of money and off he went. But the Bible tells us that he wasted it all on wild living or as the Passion Translation puts it, he wasted it on prostitutes and a binge of extravagant and reckless living. Anyway, the money eventually ran out and he didn't even have enough to buy himself some food. And we know the story, don't we, that he ended up on a pig farm looking after pigs 
and was even tempted to eat the pig slops. And then it says these words, one day he finally came to his senses. <laughs> anyway, so humiliated, this son finally realized what he was doing and he thought, there's many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slops? I want to go back home to my father's house. And I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home. And from a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son, who was returning home. The father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. And then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. And then it says, the father interrupted and said, Son, you're home now. And turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I'll place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I'll put it on his finger. And bring out the best shoes that you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For my beloved son was once dead, but now he's alive. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now, whilst the son was away, I wonder how his father felt. I bet he was thinking about him every day, just wondering how he was doing. He might have even had a few sleepless nights, wondering if he was okay, what he was doing, who he was hanging around with. Was he safe? Was he in any trouble? And would he ever see him again? We know, don't we, that he longed for him to come back. And he would have prayed for him every day. And he waited patiently for him. And then every day he would go out and just have a little look just in case he could see him coming. And then one day he did. <laughs> and it says that, that he was overwhelmed with love and compassion and he ran to meet him. I wonder how many of us on our worst day, when we've well and truly messed up, or when we've been far away from God in our own distant land doing our own thing, how many of us come back to our Heavenly Father? How many of us come to our senses, lay down our pride and go home? And how many of us will be willing to have that conversation with our Heavenly Father about how stupid we might have been? And then we become overwhelmed then as we realize that our Heavenly Dad is for us He's not against us. He's always waiting and wanting us to come back to him. He's always waiting and wanting to forgive us and to pour out his love and compassion upon us and to restore our true identity back to us as his sons and daughters. It says in the Bible that there's a great celebration in heaven when we come back to God and the Father he said it like this, my son was dead, but he's alive, he was lost, and now he's found. Let's celebrate. You know, without Jesus, we are dead. The Bible tells us that we are dead in our sins. We are lost. We are far away from God. It's like being in that distance land, so to speak. But when we come back to the Father, when we repent, when we turn back to him, suddenly we are fully alive and we are no longer lost. And that brings so much joy to the Father that all heaven celebrates. And so that's the Father welcoming us 
accepting us, forgiving us, and restoring our identity and our dignity and our authority. Now in this story, the son has an older brother. And I just want to read you from verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the older brother is out in the field, probably working for his father on the family land. And he hears music and dancing in the house. But his response to the return of his younger brother is very interesting. His response to his younger brother's repentance is not mercy, it's not compassion, and it's not joy. It's actually anger. He is angry, and he is so angry that when his father invites him into the house, he refuses to go in. And his father's explaining to him, look, your brother is back home. He's safe and sound. This is fantastic news. We didn't even know if he was still alive. Please, please come in and celebrate with us. But he refused to go in. No way, he says. I've stayed here. I've been slaving for you for years. And I've never done anything wrong. I've never disobeyed you. And you... You've never even given me a goat so that I could have a party with my friends. It's interesting how the older son sees his relationship with his father. Even though he is a son, he sees himself as a slave. He sees himself as a servant. He sees his relationship with his father in the terms of his work and his obedience. And also notice the language that he uses when he says, this son of yours, he doesn't say my brother, he says, this son of yours, he has wasted all that money you gave him, and now you want me to celebrate. His language and his actions reveal his heart and how disconnected he was from the father's love. But the father refuses to accept this image of his son that he is painting of himself. And he says, he says, my son, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now remember the setting of the parable when Jesus delivered it. It was in the context of the Pharisees and the scribes who saw themselves as righteous. They saw themselves as the ones who were keeping the commandments and they were obeying and serving God. And yet they were so angry that Jesus was offering mercy and compassion, salvation and the opportunity for repentance to sinners. The religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes who felt that way about Jesus when he ate with sinners are very much like the older brother who instead of feeling joy at the repentance of a sinner, they feel anger. They were unable to move in the compassion <clears throat> and mercy of God and certainly could not understand why Jesus moved in this way towards the worst of sinners. But this was the reason that Jesus told them this parable, to teach them about the Father heart of God. Let me just go back for a second to that verse, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 
Jesus came for each one of us. He came to save us from the ruin and destruction of a life without him. Maybe you can identify with one of the sons. You know, the younger one who experienced all the privileges of being with the father, but became dissatisfied with his life. So being a bit rebellious, he thought life would be much better if he could just get away. But even with plenty of money and wild living, doing whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, it didn't last. And he ended up hungry and destitute on a pig farm, desperate to get back to his father. There's a great verse in John 6:37 in the message translation, and it's what Jesus says. Jesus says this, every person the father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, listen to this, and once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. I came down from heaven not to follow my own agenda, but to accomplish the will of the one who sent me. Or do you identify with the older son? Again, he had all the privileges of being with the father, but he just couldn't see it. He was just obsessed with obeying the rules and doing everything right. And so he seen himself as a slave rather than a son. And even as the father was pleading with him to come into the house and celebrate, all he did was make excuses and blame everyone and everything for what had happened. So he doesn't go in. But even so, the father still affirmed him as his son. Or do you identify with the father? You don't have to be an older man to identify with the father. Having the revelation of the father's heart isn't dependent on whether you're a man or a woman or whether you're young or whether you're old. As we come out of lockdown, I think many people will have had their identity in Christ challenged. Through lack of fellowship, and through the many different ways that we've had to live our lives due to COVID. And so we are going to need spiritual fathers and mothers. We're going to need those with the revelation of the father's heart to welcome the sons and daughters as they come home and to help mentor and disciple them so that they can have their true identity in Christ restored. Should we just stand? Is that okay? And we'll just pray. You know, Father God, this morning, we just realize how precious we are to you. We don't always feel that way. But Lord, your word tells us that when we turn to you, that you are our heavenly dad, our heavenly father, and our true identity is as your sons and daughters. And Jesus, we thank you that you came for each one of us. You came to find us, to look for us, Lord. You came to save us and set us free from all the stuff that we get involved in, Lord, that isn't good for us. And you came because your Father had a plan for each one of our lives. And this morning, we just want to take a moment and just turn back to you. We thank you, God, that you just want to restore our full identity as sons and daughters. We're not who we think we are sometimes, Lord. When we're in a distant land or when we're in a pig pen, we don't think very much of ourselves. But when we come to you, our full identity of sons and daughters of the living God is put right. I just pray for anyone this morning who just feels far away from you, Lord, that they'll feel that they can turn back to you even right now and know that they are fully accepted and forgiven and loved. I pray for anyone who just feels a bit like the oldest son, who just kind of like making excuses and blaming everything and everyone and not really entering into that place with you Jesus that relationship with you I just pray for them Father God that you give them revelation of who you are today and Father for those of us 
Lord, who've had revelation of your heart, of your compassion, of your love, Lord. We're so thankful for that, Lord. And I pray for anyone who, you know, who's stepped out as a spiritual mother or a spiritual father but has been disappointed or hurt. I pray for anyone who feels like that today, that they would be restored by you, Jesus. And Father, that you'd fill us again afresh with your fire, Lord. That you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. That you would set us on fire, Lord, because there's a great work to be done. Lord, we know that sons and daughters are going to be coming home and they need the mums and dads to welcome them back and to restore them full identity, Lord. Would you fill us today, Lord? Would you fill us afresh? Fill us with your fire, Lord. Please, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you've spoken to us this morning, Lord. And I pray that we'll be strengthened and empowered to move forward in the things that you've got for each one of us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, Lord. Amen. spoke a word you were singing over me and you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, show oh, it chases me, the fights to
We just thank you this morning, Father, that you are the perfect Father. And your love, Lord, is just, wow, it's just the best. And so we thank you, Lord, that you call each one of us closer to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being sons and daughters of the living God. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Amen. Wow, what a great morning we've had this morning together in the building at home. Just to remind you all, next week it's church at home. Then the following week it's back in the building and at home. But if you want a seat for the 23rd, please book in. And also, don't forget this afternoon, kids call with Kate at 2.30 on Zoom. Have a great week. See you soon. God bless. Bye now.